Hello, everybody. Welcome to the December Beginner Circle here at TAM Integration. Uh, my name is Daniel. Very, very glad that you're here. And today we are going to be talking, we're going to be fielding your Q&A about plant medicine, healing, and the like, uh, with a focus on Amanita muscaria. We have um, our brilliant and lovely guest, Amanita Dreamer, who has a website that shares wisdom, knowledge, information, methodology around all things Amanita. Um, She's got an amazing YouTube channel, um, an amazing community forum. Um, before we get going with that, I would like to offer you a little bit of a meditation and uh, a few thoughts. Um, very, it is just, I, I didn't think about this when I invited her, when I invited you, but um, you know, I've realized it's the holiday season, right? And the holiday season, is um, sort of intertwined with this with the season of, of the Amanita. And there are many people who run around saying that, oh, you know, Santa Claus is the Amanita mushroom and they have all kinds of stories about that. And I don't know if it's quote unquote true or not, but I do would like to talk about it a little bit because it is a good metaphor. It's a good story uh, for those of us who are practitioners and those of us who are trying to grow and heal. And so the story goes is that, um, you know, Santa Claus was a, was a shaman in Siberia. Um, right. So it's an, you know, an Asian woman, most likely, right. Santa Claus was most likely an Asian woman. Um, the all time mountains or something like that. And she would feed her, Amanitas to the reindeer, right? So the reindeer would fly, right? The reindeers would get high, and then she would drink the urine of the reindeer, they would say, to filter out some of the uh, poisons or some of the difficult things to digest, like the muscimol, and would be left with more of the ibotenic acid that, you know, he would be able to um, journey, right? And so the idea of, of journeying is. Um, that you know relates to the chimney and so we see all over cultures that you know the the shamans of, of many cultures or the yogis as it were even yogis the meditators the practitioners would have this practice of going up to the upper worlds and the lower world symbolized by the chimney um, the world tree you know in norse mythology um, in um, the kabbalah and the sefi wrote when would travel up and down um, the the idea of going climbing the mountain, right? Um, going into the underworld, right? Uh, Joseph Campbell's hero's myth. Um, somebody would go to the underworld, the hero would go to the underworld and then they would climb the mountaintop and they would be transformed and they would change and they would come back down to the village and bring with them what they had learned. Uh, if we're meditators, um, then this world bridge, this world tree or this chimney is our very spinal column, right? And it's the chakra system. And so this idea of kind of traveling up and down the chakra systems, the chakras being um, almost like these cauldrons where energy is collected and transformed and then shared again. And, um, and so when, you know, Santa Claus would come down the chimney, right? Bringing presents. Uh, bringing wisdom for the tribe, you know, with the help of the elves, the nature spirits, the spirits of nature and of, of the land. And it's very good. It's, it's very nice that we leave him cookies, right? And milk. So there's this idea of hospitality that is being offered to the other, which is um, really a good thing for us to remember because um, you know, it, it kind of goes with the idea of, you know, the holidays about being, you know, it's better to give than to receive because the rest of the year, we are very much all about what are we receiving, right? We're very, we tend to be um, very self-centered. We're very wrapped up in the ego and part of our quest as um, psychedelic practitioners is, you know, people are like, oh, I want to kill my ego. Right, it's like I was basically saying I want to I want to rid my without knowing it, without knowing it. Perhaps one of the things that we're saying is I want to rid myself 
of self-centeredness, right? And I want to be more hospitable to the people around me and maybe even to the land around me and to the non-human intelligence around me. Um, a lot of us know that when we take psychedelics, we experience a greater sense of nature relatedness that we um, connect more deeply to um, the land and the spirits of the land. We might see elves and um, fairies and things of that nature, that, that kind. And so there's this very much, this story, myth of, of Santa Claus almost seems like a, a bit of a redemption. There's uh, anybody, anybody like know Beowulf? You know, it's like a real ancient, ancient story. And it's sort of like, it's, it's almost like a, a Christmas gone bad. Um, you know, we think of Christmas as that, and, and we're, everybody kind of travels to the great hall, like everybody comes to be with their family. And there's all of this, um, you know, drinking and conviviality and feasting and presence and all of this sort of like human activity and joy. Right. And this is kind of how Beowulf starts. Um, but there was an outside force there was like nature being there was like this monstrous thing from the point of view of humans um that was outside the hall that was like outside this is like our unconscious right um this was this is the the shadow part of us that we are not necessarily interested in uh interfacing with most of the time right these are the demons that if you, you've taken my course right we feed the demons uh, we offer them hospitality and so you know, Grendel comes up to the hall and kind of scratches at the door. He's kind of like wants to come in. And um, hey, can I can I have some of that? Can I have some of this joy and happiness? And the humans are too self-centered. They can't hear him. They're making too much noise. They're partying. And he flies into a fit of rage and destroys the hall, um, which sets off like a whole other unfortunate turn of events. So, you know, what we are doing you know, with this, this part of this myth where we're putting out, you know, the milk and the cookies, right? It's like, sometimes one of the things that we see a lot is um, people will go to, you know, homeless shelters, perhaps, you know, people that we keep on the periphery and we'll feed people at a soup kitchen or things like that, engage in charitable activities. And, you know, we are making a nod to, oh, I need to, um, you know, engage the other in a way that is more kind of heartfelt and spirited and, and just kind of widen my circle, which is often what our psychedelic experiences ask of us is to include more and more and more of ourselves, is to allow, um, to allow the parts of ourselves that we deem monstrous or other or unworthy and invite them in, invite them in. And so what I would like you to do, and we'll just do a few minutes because I, I talked longer than I expected, but, uh, but I did. So what I would like you to just do real, real simply is just visualize from the base of the spine to the crown of the head, All right? So the, at the tip of the spine at the tailbone is called the root chakra and the top of the head is the crown. And then there's a tube of light, right? Two or three inches in diameter and it connects them. And so all I'm going to ask you to do is inhale from the bottom to the top, right? And just visualize light and color, perhaps moving from the bottom to the top and then exhale from the crown back to the tailbone. And do it with a sense of hospitality. All right? Just with a sense of like, oh, I'm including all of me and I'm centering myself, right? In a place where... I can extend hospitality, care, and love to all parts of myself. And even to, by extension, everybody else who's here with us, right? It's really, I, I never cease to be full of gratitude that people show up to talk about these things. You know, there was a time when I couldn't, you know, where, where you couldn't be known as being interested in these sorts of things, right? The stigma, the... Uh, danger. So just inhaling from the tailbone to the crown and exhaling from the crown to the tailbone. And 
And so just, just welcoming, welcoming yourself to the circle, welcoming each other to the circle. While at the same time, recognize that there are 26 other people here who are welcoming you, who are thrilled that you're here. And so just allow the appreciation to come in. Maybe even just extending that sense of hospitality to, to your land that you're on and that which surrounds you, the spirits. Actually, pretty sure I found some ghosts in my attic the other day. They assured me they wouldn't do anything. They, they wouldn't dream of hurting us. They like the baby. So that's nice. Just a few more moments, maybe just five or six more breaths like this. I know you can keep breathing for another moment or two. And I know I maybe didn't talk much about the Amanita itself as we were speaking, but, you know, this whole Cosmovision, you know, I, I, in, in, from what I can tell, my experience with the Amanita is small, admittedly. They do grow around here. But that's another nice thing about them is that they're wild, is that you can't really cultivate them. You can sort of invite them to grow in your neighborhood sometimes, but for the most part, they do what they want. They're, they're included in this, this kind of spirit of that which is uh, beyond human control and comprehension in a lot of ways. And so if you would like to kind of continue this breath throughout, throughout the talk, then you're welcome to do so. Or you can shake yourself off and drink some water and I'm a dreamer. I would love to turn it over to you. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So what I do when I have an open agenda like this, where the host doesn't say these are the things our community needs or this is what our community would like for you to discuss is I um, ask the mushroom what they want to convey and um, listen to you and what you're sending me and just sort of like try to be Grand Central Station and connect the two of you. So basically they want to say, um, we're really happy to have your attention in this because they, one of the first things that they told me really early on, once they had my attention was we really miss the humans and we have a very long history and it goes back pretty far. We were there when humans were starting to really be creative and dance and become enlightened and try to expand their horizons and create art. 
and we we were part of that that coming of age and that celebration and we have been inseparable and scientifically we think it could go back as far as 35,000 years our relationship with this mushroom and they said that it feels like we've been through a divorce one we didn't want and the humans just walked away and they have been telling me you know it's why you're broken we have what you need we have the medicine you need and it's hurting us to watch you suffer but not only that like we missed the connection we had and one of the things that has taken me so long to be able to speak like this is because I was raised in the sciences I'm, I'm science based and the idea that fungi can be sentient is foreign to me all the way up until I took Amanita I understood the power of psychedelics but I only understood it as far as a, a biochemistry thing I didn't understand I thought people were just being human and making up stories about things they didn't understand scientifically and if that made them digest it better, the healing, then who cares? Tell yourself a story. And then I did Amanita and my, um, I don't know, my, my very skewed view of it started to really become known to me that how I had been gaslighted by science and, and the construct. And very early on, right after I took it, I had that mushroom voice and it never went away. I and mean, I'm not schizophrenic. It's not any kind of a, I mean, and maybe it is, but I know that other people that also use Amanita also have the mushroom voice on board. And it has been beautiful. I don't know too many people with a schizoaffective disorder that it's just 100% beautiful all the time. And that that's my experience with it. I've had to really wrestle and reckon with this and have lots of existential crises to finally embrace what I know is absolutely my truth now. And that is that it has been very species centric to believe that we are the only sentient living things in the entire universe and that we are the only sentient living things on planet Earth. And now I believe we are probably pretty stupid as far as sentience goes. And we're trying, we're doing our best, we're trying to get there. And I understand now, it is my perception that there is so much sentience going on around us. And there has been a lot of joy and togetherness with humans and the trees and the fungi and the bacteria for millions of years. And that we are asleep, we are, we, we divorced, we had to go be young and, and impetulant, and now we're coming back home. And hopefully what I say like this won't be met with skepticism and it won't make people disregard the message or the science that I'm bringing. And if it does, then okay, then maybe I'm just crazy and I have to tell myself a story to make sense of what's happening here and the power in it. That aside, the science is, is there for anyone to see, and I leave the links to it. But it is my understanding, and it has been ever present from day one, that these are incredibly sentient beings, that they have hopes and dreams, they have failings, they have fears, they have goals and ambitions, they have sadnesses and broken hearts, they have personalities and lives, they have a history and ancestors just like us. And I am trying not to personify them, but to listen to what it is that they are saying to me about their goals and dreams and lives. A December to remember. So it's interesting to me when I heard them hurt and when I listened to them celebrate. And the thing that they want us to know is number one, you are terribly broken. And we have the medicine and we hope that you use it. We hope that you find your balance again. That's, but that's just like the bottom of the whole thing. Just get your shit together, get it all cleaned up so that you can do what you came here to do. And that's experience because you sure didn't come here to fight for survival. 
you came here to experience and to live. And so we want to see you do that. We hope then you return to the celebrations with us because we would really like to see you again. They enjoy the conversations that they have with each of us one-on-one. And then they enjoy the seeing all of us come together in celebration. And what they want us to know is that in our separateness and aloneness, we are broken. And that it's when we come together and celebrate that we heal, that beautiful things happen when we sit around a fire, when we play drums, when we laugh and and mark time, the calendar together, the rising and setting of the sun and the moon cycles and solstices, that these things are a part of life on earth and they have special meanings and energies in them that work with our biology to help us heal. And they enjoy being part of those celebrations too, not only in our private meditations and medicines, but also in that celebration. That was a message from the mushroom. I would like to address you and some of the things that you are thinking about. And one might be that you're new to the mushroom. You've seen enough of what I do and what other people say to know that it really isn't going to kill you. It really is a good medicine. And all you got to do is prepare it correctly. And I can ask if you want me to go through the details, but I can also tell you, you can just watch the video about how to prepare it just so you can start microdosing it and get on board with it, get that mushroom voice going so you can start listening to your own body and know where you want to go with it. But the most common question I get is, if you make the tea, then what are you supposed to do with it after you make it? And that answer is, yes, it freezes well, split it into fourths, freeze three fourths of it, keep one out to use. The second biggest question I get is how do you find your dose? And as you know, Amanita muscaria is not like any other mushroom medicine. It's not a one size fits all for every reason. And that is because any one Amanita muscaria mushroom is going to vary widely from another as to how much actives are in it. And then you can't judge it by the size of it because you can have a very small one that's, I don't know, maybe five centimeters in diameter that can be 10 times stronger than one that's 15 centimeters in diameter. You can have one that's the size of a dinner plate that's empty, like almost no actives in it at all. I've experienced that too. And you can have a button that'll knock you on your ass if you ate just that one by itself. And that's called hot dosing. Then there's your own biology. The biology, the physiology of the mushroom and your biology, when combined, create a third thing that's unique to you from week to week, month to month, year to year, based on your mental health and your chemistry at the time. It also may have a lot to do with your gut health which would make a lot of sense because this mushroom is highly dependent on bacteria in its environment. And you are highly dependent on bacteria in your environment. The bacteria that can convert it to put it into a a safer state for you to use, bacteria can do that. And then your bacteria is gonna determine when you take it in, how it's going to be metabolized. So these are some things that I'm running around with in hypotheses, but there's no science on that, on that whole story that I'm saying. But what we do know is it is based in in the bacteria in the soil about when and where it can grow. And that there is a bacteria that can convert the abatinic acid to muscimol. And then we do know that it is affected by the bacteria in your gut as to how much of it is going to convert in your gut. But putting that whole picture together and the rest of that story, we don't know. So the ibotenic acid then is probably 95% ibotenic acid, maybe 5% muscimol in that mushroom. There's very little muscimol in it. And like other things, there's decarboxylation conversion from one substance to another substance. 
and your body can do it, or you can do it outside the body, which is also true for psilocybin. But ibotenic acid is an active and it does have a purpose. And then muscimol is an active and it has a purpose. And there is a beautiful amount of time between when one converts to the other in the body that a lot of medicine and healing is happening. And so it is merely my opinion for what that's worth, that it's best to take this mushroom in in very small doses just to get it on board so that that medicine as an adaptogen can tell you where you need to be and it can do its work. Both medicines can do their work. So what I did when I first took it was like a 50, 50 decarb. And then if I want to do higher doses, then I go on and push more decarb because ibotenic acid, some people are highly sensitive to it. Some people aren't, it's, it's not common at all to be highly sensitive to ibotenic acid. And then some people are more sensitive to getting muscle spasms and that kind of thing. And just from anecdotal information, it's looking like, hang on a minute. It's looking like people that have had Epstein-Barr who then have fibromyalgia are going to get some muscle spasm issues with ibotenic acid. Also, people that have been on benzodiazepines will tend to get some spasming issues with ibotenic acid. I tolerate it. I have both. And I tolerate the muscle spasms because I believe that the ibotenic acid medicine is that important. If you have gastrointestinal responses to it and you get all crampy in your gut and you get nauseous or whatever, then whatever amount of decarb you did, just do a little bit more next time play with your dosing. Maybe you took too much back off your dosing. Some, this is a mushroom that you're going to have to work with. So when I tell you, I can't give you a dose, this is why it just, you can't do it the same way that you can psilocybin, but even with psilocybin, there is a variation in strength of actives, but more with psilocybin, you can say this strain tends to be this much stronger than this strain in general. Whereas with Amanitas, you can't make any statements. You can't say the American ones are stronger than the European ones. That's just not a statement. There, there's no consistency there at all. It's just from one to the other. The only thing that we have found is the ones that fruit last in a season are going to be weaker than the ones that fruit first in that mycelium, which makes sense because they're pulling those nutrients out and packing them into those fruits right off the bat because they don't know what kind of season it's going to be and they could get one rain and then no more rain and all, and they threw everything into those first mushrooms and then that was all that they were going to get and that's the season we had here likewise if you wind up with a really rainy season and they just keep fruiting it's going to make sense that they're going to deplete the nutrients that are in being held in the mycelium and in the surrounding soil so that they would just get progressively weaker with each fruiting that that's true and that makes good sense, but that's the really the only general thing you can say about them. So when people insist on me giving them dosing, this is why I can't for all of those reasons, which is why I say, again, start small. And when I say small, I mean, most people that are afraid start with a quarter of a teaspoon of the tea and they get absolutely nothing. They don't understand why I even bother with it. And then they go up to a half a teaspoon. A lot of people sift out there. Some people keep going. I know people that take as much as two tablespoons as a microdose. In, and in the definition of a microdose. So that's your range. And that's a huge range. And so when I say you have to find your dose, start small and work your way up. It really is start small and work your way up. So if you want to know where to start, like what is a microdose? What is a macrodose? what is a hero dose, then what you're going to be looking for is, you know how with psilocybin, when you microdose psilocybin, when you first take it, you, and even after 30 minutes or whatever, mostly all you're going to feel is a sense of openness, brightness. Maybe you're thinking more clearly, a little more creative problem solving. Maybe you have more focus and energy. And that's really all. Like If you're starting to see color variations, you took a little too much. I was in Vancouver and I, they had a, a dispensary there. I'm like, oh, go buy some in a dispensary. 
So I bought some, I didn't know about like really intensely crazy, strong psilocybin mushrooms. And I was going to do them while I was there, but then we found this flush of amanitas and that video's up, but that's all we're doing. It was a 24 hour forage. I didn't have time to do them. So the morning I had to get up to get on the plane to come back to the States, I couldn't take them with me. So I was like, well, I'll just microdose and I'll throw the rest away. And that really sucks. And I kid you not, I took a tiny little piece of a stem. By the time I got to the airport, y'all, I was tripping. <laughs> like, this is not cool. And uh, I had to tell the guy there that I was acting ridiculous getting my COVID test that I was tripping. And so I remembered that when you're tripping and they want to kill a trip, they give you benzodiazepines, which hit the GABA receptors, which this mushroom also does. And I had a tincture with me. So I downed like five droppers of my tincture. And within about 20 minutes, I was stone cold sober. Trip was over, gone. I didn't have to worry about getting on an airplane like that. Just a little anecdotal information. So even when you microdose, it's, uh, yeah, anyway. With Amanita, when you microdose, the most that you should really hope for is an abatement of anxiety and a sense of calmness. And when I use it, like when I smoke it at the end of the day or a microdose or whatever, it's mostly just to get a sense of stopping the brain, especially if I went off the rails if the day took me in directions I didn't intend and I didn't do a very good job of working it. Then if I microdose my regular microdose and I'm still having thoughts that are invasive, I'll take a little more. But mostly what you want is an abatement of all that. You want to feel calm and at peace with direction, focus, and motivation. And that's that ibotenic acid. So if you're sitting there, if you took it and you've been ruminating in that email and then what that person said, and then you're worrying about the thing, and then all of a sudden you find yourself going, you know what, though, it really isn't that bad. And I'm really looking forward to getting that gift for so-and-so. I wonder, I should wrap that. Oh, the dishes need to be done. For, oh my God, I forgot about these five things. How could I have forgotten those things? And you make the list. And you're like, you know what? I'll get to those first. And then I'm going to go do the dishes. And I'm going to wrap this present. And the next thing you know, it's been two hours. And you're like, wow, I got a lot done. And I feel good. And I'm not worried. Everything is good. It's a good day. It's a good life. This is awesome. And that's when I want you to go, oh, Amanita, got it. Okay, that's a microdose. If you get any more than that, then you're pushing the edge of your microdose. A macrodose. If that happens to you and you get up to do the things and you go, what? Did you, did you see? Okay, I didn't see that. I didn't. Anyway, and you start walking, you go, holy crap, I thought it was 1998 for a second. Why did I do that? That is so weird. I keep seeing things over here. Is there somebody? Why do I keep seeing somebody over there? Why am I even here? It is so ridiculous that we have kitchens. I can't believe we used to cook by a fire. If that is what's happening to you, then you're in macrodose land, which has a place and it's very therapeutic. But I wanted you to know the difference like in your thought processes between the micro and then when you're switching over into the macro. If you start seeing things in your peripheral vision, then you're in the macro. If you have moments where you're temporarily out of time and you're displaced in time, then you're starting that macro. And if you start to question or think that things are ridiculous, that's a big indicator that you're in a macro. Seeing things as ridiculous, that's, that's the key. That's the jokester in the ibotenic acid. That's Loki coming for you. Loki's awesome. And the top end of your macro is going to be where you got the stupid grin on your face. You think it's all, all just ridiculous and you quit doing the dishes because <laughs> who cares? about the dishes and the dishes are ridiculous and then everything is just ridiculous and you really want to listen to music. Then you're getting on the top end of your macro dose. And then that becomes more intense when you're getting to the beginning of your trip dose. 
And the beginning of a trip dose is an intense desire to listen to music and dance. Dance, move your body, move your body, move your body, move your body. That is the beginning of a trip dose. Remember when I told you they liked for us to celebrate around the fire? They, they make us remember dancing around the fire. They make you want to listen to drums and music. And for you, I created a drum list on Spotify. And it's all different cultures of drums. So wherever you are genetically or whatever you are predispositioned to, you will find some drums there for you if you feel the need. And then if you start to really see alternate timelines and alternate realities, the way that you'll likely see it is in front of you and you'll see it around objects. So if there's a, like a grandfather clock that you've inherited, you will start to see behind it, even though you're in front of it, and you will potentially see two or three of them. And then those two or three will be existing in other timelines that you will know intuitively when you look at them. And then the times on the clock may be the same, but you will hear Loki laughing about it that you think the time is the same on the clock. And then you will be able to visually move it around. But as you move reality around, you will also leave the space time continuum and, and then relocate yourself in another reality timeline in time. And further in that trip, when you no longer know what time it is or what day it is, then you are well on your way in your trip. And to know you're in a trip dose is to know that you have no idea what day or time it is. You may not even know that you live where you're standing or where you are anymore. And, and you will be okay with that. It takes you completely out of the construct of time, but you're still here and associated with it and interacting with it. But you really will not probably care what the day or the time is. And you may sort of have a feeling you know the people around you, but not really remember how you know the people around you. So that's all the stuff that I sort of could pick up that you guys were putting out like right off the bat. So I can open it to questions now so that I can serve you better. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to let the people know that if you folks, if you're watching us on YouTube later, then join us, you know, like this is the second Thursday. Like if you want to be part of the Q and a, you can show up next month and there'll be a Q and a and it'll be fun. Um, oh, let me tell them if, for those oh, folks. Yes. YouTube is harshly censoring my content and I had to build my own website and the pay for the bandwidth to move all of my videos over there. So please use it. P yes. Please, anything you want to know, I promise you it's there. And if it's not, I'm working on it. I got a list of videos I'm still working on. So it's there. Go to amnitadreamer.net, amnitadreamer.net. It's over there. I should put it on my little right here, but yeah. Right. Um, amnitadreamer.net. TamIntegration.com, join the Tam Zone, Tam.Zone, and we appreciate uh, we appreciate your attention and hope that uh, you can avail your nervous system of some Amanitas soon. Uh, many blessings and stop.